beginning, what's important about soil is the grain size. The bigger the size of the grain, the more stable the soil is. And uh, because uh, any soil, uh, any soil particle bigger than one tenth of a millimeter doesn't uh, produce any problems for us as engineers. So uh, you see that a lot of issues go to that very teeny tiny part that uh, particles are much less than uh, one millimeter or uh, close to one mile. I'm not talking about the big size gravels or sands. I'm going to very teeny tiny particles. Let's say this is a silt and this is only okay. This is this dimension is only one hundredth of a millimeter. And there is another particle here. And there is another particle here. This size we call it silt or very fine sand. What happens is that when you put pressure, these rough edges click to each other and make a structure which is resistant. Okay? So if majority of the grains are bigger than this size, you have no problem. It's 0 0.1, not 0 0.01, right? 0 0.01, yes. Yeah. But this is, this is the, the core of the issue. Compared to this, this is a piece of clay. A piece of clay is so much smaller than these guys, which are already too small. And there is another important property of clay is that it can absorb water. Of course, all of them can absorb water. But you see, water molecules in here do not do much. But here, they will make a film around this. OK? So they work like ball bearings. If there are enough of these wall, wall bearings here, okay, they fill up gaps between these tiny small guys. If there are enough wall bearings here, they can move around each other. They never click to each other. Here, with this type of soil, no problem. We don't like organic material at all. So any place that you find something like this, called pit, that contains a, a small piece of wood, a small piece of leaf, and organic material, it's not good for us. It is like a milkshake. <laughs> okay. So what happens? The granules will go down, they settle down, and the clay particles will float. Okay? Give it one hour. The standard test is for 24 hours, and the reading is quite different. But for you, for us, we don't want to do a geotechnical test. We will continue, and after one hour, we will see what happens, OK? If you make a roll like this and it breaks, it doesn't mean that you are fine. Try again. Reduce the water, or add water, or leave it there for one hour and come back after one hour. Change the surface. Whatever you can do to make a nice, tiny, the role of this one. If there is no way that you can make a role, it's a good soil for you. 
although it is small, although the particles are at the size of clay, but they are not plastic. You are good. You don't need to bring it anywhere. But if you manage to do something like this with the soil, it is bad. It means that if, it, if you change the moisture of the soil, the characteristic will change. If it goes dry, it will become something else. If you add water, it will become something else. So this is exactly what you do with clay or something that to find out. It, it seems to be like the question is, is the clay plastic or not? This test will give you an impression. I repeat, these are not the standard tests. These are not what geotechnical engineers do. They do much more elaborate tests. But for me and you, just to decide if it's safe enough to do it myself or I have to call somebody. If you can make something like this, call somebody. If you cannot make a roll like this, you are fine. You can go on yourself because the soil, this is what happens. You go to a site. If you find out that it is a granular material, okay, you have to find out if it is compact or loose. And that's the end of the story for you. But if you go to a site and find out that it is mostly clay, it doesn't mean that it ends right there. You have to find out if the clay is stiff or hard or soft. So right now we are talking about granular material. Granular material, you take a stick like this, and try to push it in the ground. So, in order to call the geotechnical guy, first, it should be clay. Second, the clay should be plastic. And third, it should be soft. So even if it's clay and it is hard, no matter how much you push, you cannot leave a, a, the fingerprint on the wall of the of the exca excavation, you are good. You don't need to worry about that. Only if it is loose sand or soft sand. I expected a question here what will be asked. So I got it myself. If we try so much and the stick doesn't go more than 10 centimeters, it's hard. It's compact. We know. That's fine. If we push it and it goes more than 20 centimeters, it's loose. We know that. But what happens in the borderline? You try so much and it goes 18 centimeters. You always wonder if it was somebody else stronger than me or the weather condition was different. Maybe it could have gone to him. What should I do? Shall I? Call it loose sand or shall I call it compact sand? Here is the definition of warm base. The main issue is the insulation is at the outer wall of the base. This is why most of the times they arrange the timetable somehow that as soon as they dig out, the, s the next day they pour the foundation. They don't leave the uh, the excavation unattended for long because of this kind of situation. Another important thing is safety. From all that you're saying, it almost seems like my takeaway is if the client is willing to take the advice to get borehole testing, to have all these answers, where is the water table, what is the quality of the soil, for any time we're underpinning and putting in addition, it's the most conservative we can do. Yes. Do you, agree? yes. you mean do you need a proper tube digging? Yeah. yeah. Agree. So the engineer knows exactly yeah. they're not making assumptions. Yeah. I feel like as architects I would be more comfortable saying, oh yeah, you could use a two by eight there or two by ten, but I wouldn't be too comfortable gauging if the soil is you know Well it depends on the the type of business. You want to go conservative, 
more hole to technical testing is the best way to go. But sometimes you, you wonder if the soil is good enough, if everybody else in the neighborhood is doing the same thing, mm -hmm. if nobody has any complaints, yeah. shall I spend a couple of hundred more on this or not? What I'm uh, uh, trying to present here is the ways that you can make sure that the soil is good, no, there is no problem with that, and please remember we are talking about part nine only. Right. If you are dealing with some uh, elaborate design, some high rise or low yeah. rise or something else, this doesn't happen. Yeah. But you are doing just a two story wood frame structure. I showed you before, the code says that forget about the dead <laughs> altogether. Mm -hmm. It is so easy going. Do I have to pay to somebody else to come and Give me, uh, up, uh, give me opinion about the soil that I see. It is granular, it is firm, it is hard, there's no problem. Nobody in the neighborhood is complaining, etc. Et mm -hmm. But if you encounter in a place that that's where you can tell the client that we need to have the proper soil. I don't get that up to two steps. So if your ground floor is very close to grade, mm -hmm. you don't need a foundation? No. Really? No. no, it doesn't mean about building. You're talking about the steps itself. No, 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 no. Yeah. of course. <laughs> so, so here is the, the, the kitchen. You want to go into the backyard. If you are going like three steps, you have to dig and put a foundation on the huh. But if you are two steps or less, you can just put it on the ground. But normally, the, these are old sewage lines or uh, whatever, I don't know. And sometimes you, you encounter these kind of trenches. The code allows you to fill them with material, with soil, but asks you to compact them properly. Doesn't tell you what is proper compaction. And because I have a lot of experience in this field, it is a whole lot of uh, profession built on compaction of soil, etc. Mm -hmm. So my advice is just fill it with low grade concrete. Low grade concrete. Low grade concrete. You don't have to put a lot of cement in there, but you put concrete in there and you are fine to go. You don't need to go through compaction and bring in equipment and there should be a test of compaction and what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. There's a whole lot of issues. On. And uh, here I have put under these uh, cards that foundation is needed under walls, obviously, kill stars, obviously, columns, obviously, fires, obviously, fireplace needs a foundation and chimney also. These two guys are sometimes omitted from the foundation. Chimney and fireplace also need foundation. Like real chimneys, not gas. Yes. yes. This is the natural topography of the soil. You put a foundation here, and this is the basement. You, are, you want to fill this area on the basement. But here, you cannot put foundation here. Foundation should be here, in the natural soil, undisturbed soil. You don't want to do, for example, it's a masonry wall on top. You don't want to do the masonry wall from here. You do a pyre, normally like this. You normally do a pyre like this, and put your wall on top. It says that this height should be less than this height. So, 
this is the criteria for reinforcement of glass. Here is what it talks about. This is the horizontal reinforcement. Uh, in practical terms, they call it ladder. They put it not on every course, but every other course. These are two windows. There are regulations for lintels and etc. for these openings, these windows. This part, the solid foundation wall between two openings should be more than average width of the, this one and this one. This one is, width is W1, this one is W2. This should be W1 plus W2 divided by two, at least. Otherwise, if you cannot afford that, you have to consider this as a limit. Okay. If you cannot provide this much wall in between two openings, then your uh, numerical value of opening will be from here to here. This is uh, what happens in a lot of situations. This is the concrete foundation wall. These are the bolts that you put inside the concrete, normally 100 millimeters inside the concrete, and this is the ledger board, ledger board should be two inches or 38 millimeters in thickness, and the height should be at least the same as the joist. Or if the joist is smaller, this ledger board should be at least six inches tall. And everything else is very clear. These are the uh, planks and so for flat insulated concrete form walls, laterally supported on bottom by a shear key or a double number 15 at distance of these are these work as form and also as insulation and uh, these are flat so the face of the concrete will be smooth. There are spacers in between, and there are reinforcements in there. So we're basically talking about those kind of walls, but right now in the in the foundation. Nothing about that. Those like styrofoam. Yes. Yeah. And uh, for crack control, uh, if the length of wall is more than 25 meters put joints as 50, at 15 meters. In other words, if it's less than 25 meters, you can have your wall monolithic. But if it's more than 25 meters, divide it every 15 meters. Joints shall be damp-proof. Joints shall have keys to prevent displacement. So these are two adjacent parts of the wall. There should be a key, a group going inside each other, so prevents local displacement. And this is the flow diagram for design of shallow foundations. First, you assemble information regarding a structure, type of foundation, loading. Assemble information regarding site, like topography, climate, etc. Field investigation, neighborhood info, laboratory or institute tests, whatever you have information in this regard. With all these information, you can define soil type, define allowable stress, then select foundation type. By selecting foundation type, you have to consider construction methods and uh, is there a difficulty doing that type of foundation or not? Arrangement of footing, define depth of each footing. If not acceptable, 